Please open your Bibles to the book of Zephaniah. The book of Zephaniah. If you have any trouble finding that book, then you can go to Matthew and flip a few books back. And maybe it'll be easier to find that way. I'm sure that you've all seen at some point a man at an intersection uh, wearing a, a sandwich board with a message on it. Sometimes those people have something apocalyptic on those sandwich boards. The end of the world is coming. The end is near. Repent. Uh, oftentimes, those people are seen as out of touch, overzealous, crazy religious fanatics. And yet, when I think of a fitting illustration for this book in your Bible, I think of a man with a sandwich board. <laughs> And on it says, repent, the end is near. That's Zephaniah. Zephaniah would have been the prophet on the corners of Israel saying that message, repent, the end is near. The day of the Lord is coming. I can't speak for everybody who's on a, sand, on a corner with that message, but... Certainly, the, the message itself is true. The end is near. Repentance is necessary. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to be studying this book of Zephaniah. Uh, several months ago, I took our small group through this book. Uh, what started as a break from the one another's of the New Testament became like a permanent break, break from the one another's of the New Testament. Uh, not practicing them, just studying them. <laughs> and uh, we spent quite a bit of time in Zephaniah. The reason I chose this book for our small group was I thought it would be a good, quick study. The book is only 53 verses long, and so we can get through it quickly and return to our study, but it turned into something else altogether. So over the next several weeks, we'll be studying this. We've got a couple different breaks in evening services uh, to do some other things. Uh, I and some of the other men will be gone. We actually are going to the land of Israel at the end of the year, just uh, a couple days after Christmas on into January for almost a two-week period. And so we'll finish Zephaniah. Uh, we've got a couple weeks upon our return from Israel. And so this is uh, really our plan for the end of the year, is to study this phenomenal book in your Old Testament. Tonight, what I want to do to start is just read this 53-verse book. I'm going to read the book in its entirety, and you'll see very quickly what the focus of Zephaniah is, and then we'll just walk through tonight some introductory material for how to think about Zephaniah, and that'll culminate in what I hope will be the effects of this book on our church. So in Zephaniah, turn your attention to chapter 1, verse 1, beginning there. Follow along as I read. The word of Yahweh, which came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares Yahweh. I will remove man and beast. I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the earth, declares Yahweh. So I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the names of the idolatrous priests along with the priests. And those who bow down on the housetops to the host of heaven and those who bow down and swear to Yahweh and yet swear to Milcom 
and those who have turned back from following Yahweh and those who have not sought Yahweh or inquired of him. Be silent before the Lord Yahweh, for the day of Yahweh is near, for Yahweh has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. Then it will come about on the day of Yahweh's sacrifice that I will punish the princes, the king's sons, and all who clothe themselves with foreign garments. And I will punish on that day all who leap on the temple threshold, who fill the house of their Lord with violence and deceit. On that day, declares Yahweh, there will be the sound of a cry from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, and a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the people of Canaan will be silenced. All who weigh out silver will be cut off. It will come about at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, Yahweh will not do good or evil. Moreover, their wealth will become plunder and their houses desolate. Yes, they will build houses but not inhabit them and plant vineyards but not drink their wine. Near is the great day of Yahweh, near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of Yahweh. In it, the warrior cries out bitterly. A day of wrath is that day, a day of trouble and distress, a day of de destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and the high corner towers. I will bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against Yahweh and their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of Yahweh's wrath and all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy for he will make a complete end indeed a terrifying one of all the inhabitants of the earth. Chapter 2, gather yourselves together. Yes, gather, O nation, without shame. Before the decree takes effect, the day passes like the chaff. Before the burning anger of Yahweh comes upon you. Before the day of Yahweh's anger comes upon you. Seek Yahweh, all you humble of the earth who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps, perhaps you will be hidden in the day of Yahweh's anger. For Gaza will be abandoned and Ashkelon a desolation. Ashdod will be driven out at noon and Ekron will be uprooted. Woe to the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Cherethites. The word of Yahweh is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. And I will destroy you so that there will be no inhabitant. So the seacoast will be pastures with caves for shepherds and folds for flocks. And the coast will be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They will pasture on it. In the houses of Ashkelon, they will lie down at evening. For Yahweh their God will care for them and restore their fortune. I have heard the taunting of Moab and the revilings of the sons of Ammon, with which they have taunted my people and become arrogant against their territory. Therefore, as I live, declares Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab will be like Sodom and the sons of Ammon like Gomorrah, a place possessed by nettles and salt pits and a perpetual desolation." The remnant of my people will plunder them, and the remainder of my nation will inherit them. This they will have in return for their pride, because they have taunted and become arrogant against the people of Yahweh of, Yahweh of hosts. Yahweh will be terrifying to them. He will starve all the gods of the earth, and all the coastlands of the nations will bow down to him, everyone, from his own place. You also, O Ethiopians, will be slain by my sword, 
and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, and he will make Nineveh a desolation, parched like the wilderness. Flocks will lie down in her midst. All beasts will range in herds. Both the pelican and the hedgehog will lodge in the tops of her pillars. Birds will sing in the window. Desolation will be on the threshold, for he has laid bare the cedar work. This is the exultant city which dwells securely, who says in her heart, I am and there is no one besides me. How she has become a desolation, a resting place for beasts. Everyone who passes by her will hiss and wave his hand in contempt. Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the tyrannical city. She heeded no voice. She accepted no instruction. She did not trust in Yahweh. She did not draw near to her God. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are wolves at evening. They leave nothing for the morning. Her prophets are reckless, treacherous men. Her priests have profaned the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. Yahweh is righteous within her. He will do no injustice. Every morning he brings his justice to light. He does not fail. But the unjust knows no shame. I have cut off nations. Their corner towers are in ruins. I have made their streets desolate with no one passing by. Their cities are laid waste without a man, without an inhabitant. I said, surely you will revere me, accept instruction. So her dwelling will not be cut off according to all that I have appointed concerning her. But they were eager to corrupt all their deeds. Therefore, wait for me, declares Yahweh. For the day when I rise up as a witness, indeed, my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger. For all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. For then I will give to the people's purified lips that all of them may call on the name of Yahweh to serve him shoulder to to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my dispersed ones, will bring my offerings. In that day, you will feel no shame because of all your deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proud, exalting ones, and you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. But I will leave among you a humble and lowly people. And they will take refuge in the name of Yahweh. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. When they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Yahweh has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, Yahweh, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. In that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. Yahweh your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will quiet you in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feasts. They came from you, O Zion. The reproach of exile is a burden on them. Behold, I am going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in, even at that time when I gather you together. Indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says Yahweh. It is abundantly clear what the theme of this prophet is. 
from beginning to, to end, he has in his focus a particular day, a particular period of time that he calls the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh. Some 20 times a reference to the day is made, the, the term day is used, and even when the word day isn't being used, you still have references to that particular time. You'll notice in chapter 1, verse 12, he mentions it will come about at that time. And then again, he uses a similar phrase, at that time. In chapter uh, 3, uh, verse 9, then speaking of this particular time. And then again in chapter 3, verse 19, at that time. And then in verse 20, at that time, twice is mentioned. He's got this particular time in mind. And this is where he is fixated on in his prophecy. One 16th century writer said about this book, if anyone wishes all the, prophet, all the secret oracles of the prophets to be given in a brief compendium, let him read the brief Zephaniah. It was that writer's opinion that all of the prophets were succinctly summarized in Zephaniah's prophet, prophecy. The, the name of the prophet means Yahweh hides. Whenever you get in these Old Testament names, uh, the I-A-H, as is rendered in English, Yah, Zephaniah, Obadiah, Hezekiah, that is always a reference to Yahweh something. <laughs> Yahweh is doing something. So the person's named to recall that is of, of the Lord's acting in some way or some characteristic of God. Zephaniah means Yahweh hides. Yahweh hides. And if you just turn back to chapter 2, verse 3 you can see that this is the point of hope that he holds out for his audience. At the end of chapter 2, verse 3, perhaps you will be hidden in the day of Yahweh's anger. So all of this talk of the day, this day of wrath that is coming upon Judah, it's near, it's dark, it's a day of doom and gloom, and yet there's a point of hope that he holds out for the people listening, if they would but humble themselves. Humble themselves, seek the Lord, repent. This is repentance language. Actually do what he has commanded. Then they can be hidden when that day comes. This is the, the note of rescue that he's holding out. This is, uh, if you wanted to think of, you know, how to find the gospel, if you will, in this Old Testament book, this would be Zephaniah's unique articulation of the gospel message. Yahweh has wrath coming for sinners, and yet because that same God who is just and brings wrath against sinners is also merciful and loving, uh, he's merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, because it is the same God bringing this day of wrath, then there is hope held out for sinners. They can be hidden or rescued, put away for safekeeping when that day finally comes. That's his articulation of the gospel. In the, the Hebrew Bible, this would have been Jesus' own Bible. Zephaniah is situated in one book, known as the 12, the 12. It's what we call the minor prophets. This would have been really in the middle of the Hebrew canon. You had the law, what Moses wrote, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, law, Pentateuch, Torah. That would have been the first section. And then you have the former and latter prophets. This would have been Joshua, Judges, 
Samuel, Kings, those were one book. So first and second Samuel were one book. First and second Kings were another book. And then you would have had the latter prophets, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and the 12. And then to finish the Hebrew canon, the former and latter prophets would have included Ruth, Psalms, Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Songs of, Song of Solomon, Lamentations, and then Daniel, Esther, Ezra, and Nehemiah were one book, and then Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles would have been a single book, making a total of 24 books in the Hebrew canon. Same 39 books that you have in your Old Testament, arranged a different way, these uh, two books put together as one, and then the 12 minor prophets put together as one, you would have resulted with 12, 24 books in Jesus' Bible. Now, Zephaniah, in the midst of the 12, he plays a unique role in the 12, and we'll talk about how to, how to maybe summarize this in a second. But all of these words came to a wicked unrepentant generation. This was in the time of King Josiah, according to chapter one, verse one, that verse ends in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And so he traces out his own lineage all the way back to King Hezekiah and then says that the prophecy that we hold in our hands now was delivered, was recorded in the days of King Josiah. He was the king of Judah. This is after Israel had already been exiled, but before Judah had experienced banishment from God's promised land. And so there's still a king on the throne, a descendant of David. And yet, if you know about Josiah's reign, you, you know that Josiah was actually a faithful king. Josiah was one of the few faithful kings of Judah, and he actually fulfilled prophecy made long before he was even born. Prophecy was made about him by name of these comprehensive changes that he would make in the nation. And so that commentators think that this his reform, reforms in the nation were probably made around 621, 622. Josiah reigned from 640 to 609 BC. And so since there's no mention in the book of Zephaniah about those changes, it would have been odd for such a drastic reformation to happen and it to not be mentioned in the book. And even the, the thrust of this this prophecy being God's judgment against an unrepentant people, then it seems best to place Zephaniah shortly before 622 or 621 BC. And so these words are coming before Josiah made these reforms most likely. And, and that's really the justification for why these words are so appropriate to an unrepentant people. They have not repented yet. The reforms have not been made. And so a warning, a drastic, firm warning coming to these unrepentant people is absolutely necessary. It's absolutely justified. And so the day, this coming day, wrath of God, uh, Israel's God against sinners is what's in view in this prophecy. Here's how I would summarize Zephaniah's message then to Judah and even us. I think the message is the same. Here's one way to summarize this. Zephaniah prophesied that only a humble, faithful remnant would escape the universal destruction of the day of the Lord and experience its unparalleled blessing. That's what he's communicating. Only a humble, faithful remnant, this is what remains of God's people, would escape the universal destruction of the day of the Lord and experience its unparalleled blessing. And really, that is a, a simple format for how to think about the book. In chapter 1, 
you get a lengthy description of the day of the Lord, this universal destruction that's coming on the day of the Lord. In chapter 3, you get the way the chapter ends, a lengthy description of the unparalleled blessing that is coming on the day of the Lord. And how you get from, how you escape chapter 1, the universal destruction of the day of the Lord, so that you eventually experience the unparalleled blessing that's coming behind it is to do what is instructed in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Namely, gather yourselves, seek the Lord, seek righteousness, seek humility. That becomes the solution, the hinge really on which this entire prophecy turns. You don't have to experience the universal destruction that's coming, but you can experience the unparalleled blessing. And the way to do that is succinctly to repent, gather yourselves, seek the Lord. On the outline uh, that I put up online, I included an outline of of the entire book. And I want to just briefly walk through that. Uh, the, the book begins with this superscription that we've already read in chapter 1, verse 1, where he documents his own family heritage. So he was of royal descent, Zephaniah was, because he traces his lineage all the way back to Hezekiah. But he doesn't have rights to the throne. Josiah is the king at the time. And then the book really breaks down. The contents of the book begins with an introduction of the day of the Lord, the universal destruction, and then ends with the conclusion of the day of the Lord, the unparalleled blessing. Just look briefly at the, the way the prophet describes the destruction that's coming in universal terms. Look at chapter one, verse two. I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares Yahweh. I will remove man and beast, I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. And I will cut off man from the face of the earth, declares Yahweh. The scope of this judgment that's coming is the entire earth. The entire earth. He even repeats this in chapter three, verse eight. Look again at chapter three, verse eight. Therefore, wait for me, declares Yahweh, for the day when I rise up as a witness. Indeed, my decision is to gather nations, plural, so not just the nation of Israel, but nations to assemble kingdoms, plural, to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger. For all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. The judgment that's coming is universal in scope. The entire earth is what is caught in the crosshairs here. When the day of the Lord comes and God's anger with it, it is coming against the world generally. That's the point. That's what we should take away from this. Every country, every nation, every kingdom will be included when the day of the Lord arrives. Not only is this universal destruction coming against the world generally, but also against Judah or Jerusalem particularly. The day of the Lord comes for the world generally and for Judah or Jerusalem particularly. Look at chapter 1, verse 4. He says, So I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the names of the idolatrous priests along with the priests. So he is naming his people in particular who are still in the land at the time that Zephaniah is prophesying. And even later, he identifies specific places in the land. Look at verse 10. On that day, declares Yahweh, there will be the sound of a cry from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, and a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, 
For all the people of Canaan will be silenced. All who weigh out silver will be cut off. It will come about at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, Yahweh will not do good or evil, etc. So not just the world in general, but in particular, those who received the most revelation, who were most obligated, who as a nation made a commitment that we will obey all that Yahweh commands us, this day is coming in particular for them. So sinners worldwide and sinners particularly in Jerusalem, this is why the day of the Lord is coming. Now, some people struggle uh, are challenged with where to place this day. If Zephaniah is prophesying about the day, and as you see in verse 14 of chapter 1, he calls it near numerous times, there's an urgency behind Zephaniah's message that this day is close, it's coming, it's near, it's at hand in a sense. So commentators differ on whether the day was in Zephaniah's day, whether the day happened already at the time of his prophecy in his lifetime or shortly thereafter, or whether it's still outstanding. Now, if you just let the book speak for itself, this is always good practice in hermeneutics, don't rush to history books and, and extra biblical resources outside of scripture to discern, has this happened yet? Just first exhaust everything that the prophet has said. And if you just took Zephaniah at his word, then what conclusion would you come to about whether or not the day of the Lord is historical or still future? Well, just based on what we've already read, starting at the beginning of the contents of the book, remember that the day of the Lord is coming against the world generally. It's universal in scope, not just localized to Jerusalem. And so the destruction of Jerusalem uh, in 15, or 586 BC, wasn't it? That was a localized judgment. When they were removed from the land, the temple was burned and all the people and the temple itself, even uh, pieces of it, were carried away to Babylon. That was not the day of the Lord. Their exile was not the day of the Lord because it is universal in scope. Nor was the, uh, other destructions of Jerusalem, like in 70 AD, that was also localized. And so that is not the day, the, those days don't fit the details of what is being described here. This day is not only localized, it's not only coming against Jerusalem, but everywhere else as well. And so you just ask the question, has this happened before in human history? Has God destroyed or brought about judgment against man and beast all the birds of the sky, all the fish of the sea, the ruins along with the wicked in such a way that cuts off man and beast from the face of the earth? And the answer is no, not yet. That has not happened. All of this prophecy should be taken as, with the details in mind, still forthcoming. And so that really helpfully situates us in a similar place as Zephaniah's audience, looking forward to the day of the Lord. So all of the urgency that this message created in Zephaniah's day applies to us. This day is still, from God's perspective, near. This day is still near. It is still coming. It is still hastening quickly. After the introduction of the day of the Lord, this universal destruction that's described primarily in chapter one, you get in chapter two and following the escape from the day of the Lord. 
This is the, the prophet Zephaniah, whose name means Yahweh hides. This is essentially the duties required to be hidden, as well as the motivations for practicing those duties. Just look at chapter 2. He lays out a few duties of these people who would be hidden. If you're believing the message of Zephaniah, all of, everything he said in, Zeph- in Zephaniah chapter 1, and you think, I got to get my life together. I don't want to be here when that day comes. I want to be hidden from the universal destruction of that day. Then he gives you these instructions. Verse 1 of chapter 2. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather, O nation, without shame. Before the decree, decree takes effect, before the day passes like the chaff, before the burning anger of Yahweh comes upon you, before the day of Yahweh's anger comes upon you. This is, you can sense the urgency of his message. Gather yourselves before that time. This is what you have to do. And, verse 3, seek Yahweh, all you humble of the earth who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness, seek humility. That's your duties. Gather yourselves, seek Yahweh, seek righteousness, and seek humility. And then, there is a perhaps, just maybe, there's a chance. You can be hidden. Perhaps you will be hidden in the day of Yahweh's anger, tucked away for safekeeping. What unfolds from those duties that are briefly described is really what becomes the motivation for doing them. Why, if anyone's still questioning why they should gather themselves, seek the Lord, seek righteousness, and seek humility? Well, what unfolds in verses 4 of chapter 2 all the way through chapter 3 of verse 7 becomes the motivations for doing this. And just notice, it's because God's curse comes on Judah's enemies and God's curse comes on Judah or Jerusalem as well. That's your motivation. Do these things, why? Because of what happens to Judah's enemies, namely the Philistines, just to the west of Judah. That's verses 4 through 7. Also, why do these things? Well, because of what's happening to Judah's enemies just to the east, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and what happens to Judah's enemies to the south, the Ethiopians or the Cushites. In verse 12, and then finally to the Assyrians, verses 13 through 15, to the north. So here you have motivations from the prophet. Don't delay. Repent in a hurry because all of Israel's enemies will be done away with. To the west, to the east, to the south, and to the north, all of those enemies will be decimated. And not only Israel's enemies, you don't only get a woe to them, verse 5 of chapter 2, but you also pick up in chapter 3, verse 1, with another woe. You see that? Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled the tyrannical city. If you were just hearing this read for the first time, the original audience, they might have been confused or thinking that God was still talking about Assyria, about, about Nineveh. But he's not. He's talking to Jerusalem. Because in verse 2, she did not trust in her God and, or in Yahweh. She did not draw near to her God. So this is about Jerusalem or Judah in particular. Not only will Israel's enemies be destroyed on that day, but also Again, another articulation that God's curse comes to Jerusalem as well. And so, yes, gather yourself, seek Yahweh righteousness and humility. And anyone who was willing to heed the prophet's words, if you had a believing heart by God's grace in that day, and you heard everything he had been saying about this coming day, that it was near, this was an urgent message, then what is left for you to do is found in chapter 3, verse 8. Wait. Therefore, 
wait for me, declares Yahweh. And then begins a section describing the unparalleled blessing that concludes the day of the Lord. This is the same day because again, verse 9 of chapter 3, then, for then I will give to the people's purified lips. This is the same day as when his wrath comes. And then again, as already mentioned, chapter 19 and 20 speak about at that time. So you're still dealing with the same period of time. A way to think about this is that it's the same day of the Lord, not a 24-hour period, but a, a, a span of time, some portion of time, when God's wrath comes and then blessing follows. So that's phase one of the day of the Lord comes wrath. And then phase two, what follows is unparalleled blessing. And just like the universal destruction comes against the world generally and against Jerusalem particularly, so the unparalleled blessing comes for the world generally and then for Israel or Jerusalem particularly. Just notice in chapter 3, verse 9, for then I will give the peoples, plural, purified lips. They will serve Yahweh shoulder to shoulder. That's uh, speaking about the unity of the worship of God. No more denominations. Everybody is going to be on the same page, same convictions, same faith, serving the Lord together. This is peoples of various nations. They come from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. My worshipers, my dispersed ones will bring my offerings. So this is, again, not localized worship, but this is universal worship of Yahweh God. So this is for the world generally, just like the, the curse, the judgment was for the world generally, so is the blessing. And just like the destruction was for Judah in particular, so again, this comes to Jerusalem particularly. So does the blessing. And this is the note of hope that the, the book really ends on. We'll get here in our exposition of the book, but all throughout verses 11, all the way to the end of the book in chapter 3, so 3.11 on following, the prophet picks up specific phrases from prior revelation. What Moses and other prophets had talked about was coming. Zephaniah picks up with their same phrases, not coincidentally found, you know, he's not accidentally repeating them, but he knows his Hebrew Bible and he uses the same phrases to communicate to his audience everything that those prophets said was coming the blessing that they were anticipating, I'm telling you the day of the Lord that I've been describing for you, this is the fulfillment of those promises. And so you'll note in, in verse 13, for example, the remnant of Israel will do no wrong. He's speaking about a perfected people. They will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. For, or better translated, when they feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. This is what they were looking forward to. A time when they didn't have any enemies and they could shepherd and relax in the promised land. The land would be plentiful, fruitful, just like the things that they, they carried when they spied out the land. Those grapes that they had to carry between two men right? That grape cluster. The land would be like that once again, and they would have no enemies to make them afraid. It's even repeated in verse 15. Yahweh has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, Yahweh is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. In that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. So this is what, what's coming. 
Yahweh your God is in your midst as a victorious warrior. When is that? That's forthcoming. Yahweh will one day reign from Jerusalem as the world capital, Mount Zion, in the person, the man, Christ Jesus, King Jesus. This is what he is describing here. This is the day of unparalleled blessing that's coming. And so just like Zephaniah's audience, if they were believing this message, then they would have been instructed to finally wait on this day. And because the day has not come yet, it's just 2,400 years nearer than when Zephaniah prophesied about it. Then how much more should we be anticipating this same day? looking forward to the arrival of Israel's king reigning in the midst of his people. The message is the same for us. I want to just mention a a few uh, points of impact, perhaps on Grace Bible Church. Lord willing, this will be the impact of Zephaniah's prophecy on us and much more than this. Just a few things to mention, six things for you. Number one, this will clarify our understanding of the future. As we just walk week after week through this prophecy and see how comprehensive and unified the message of the prophet is in all of its glorious details, what this should do for us is clarify for us what's coming. Uh, Maybe in your eschatology, you know, maybe this is the last area of doctrine or the least clear area of doctrine for you, and you've just put off for a long time putting the pieces together. Hopefully, Daniel, that we just finished, was helpful for you. Um, And this will only add to the clarity that that you should have about the future. Martin Luther had this to say about Zephaniah. He said, among the minor prophets... Zephaniah makes the clearest prophecies about the kingdom of Christ. I think he's right. It makes the clearest prophecies about the kingdom of Christ. And so this book should clarify our understanding of the future. Uh, Secondly, it, it should also produce a greater holiness of life in us. It should produce a greater holiness of life because we see that only those who sincerely, faithfully seek the Lord are the ones who actually escape the destruction and see the blessing of the day of the Lord. And so what should that do for us? I have to purify my life, not so that I can be saved by God, but to demonstrate the genuineness of my salvation. Just go to 2 Peter And I'll show you how a New Testament apostle has this same aim in mind for his New Testament audience. If the message of Zephaniah is that a humble, faithful remnant eventually experiences the blessing of the day of the Lord, the kingdom to come, how do the New Testament authors say this same thing? Just notice in verse 11 of 2 Peter 1, Peter says, For in this way the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. So whatever he's just been saying is about having an abundant supply given to you of your entrance into the eternal kingdom. This kingdom that begins and sees no end, this is what God told David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 would happen. There would be no end to the reign of his descendant on the throne in Jerusalem. This is, that's what makes it an eternal king, it doesn't, or eternal kingdom. It doesn't have an end. But in verse 11, he says, for in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom will be abundantly supplied to you. In what way? 
Just go back up to verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to you everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, do what? Supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren... Be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing of you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. In what way? As you add to your faith all of the qualities of godliness that I just mentioned. That in that way, by adding to your faith these things, a diligent pursuit of these points of godliness, then you will confidently, is the idea, enter into the kingdom. And so just like Peter did with his audience, Zephaniah should accomplish the same thing in us. Compelling us to practice godliness in the here and now so that we can confidently enter into the kingdom that's coming. So this should clarify our understanding of the future. It should produce a greater holiness of life. And this should, thirdly, increase our zeal for evangelism. Why do I say increase our zeal for evangelism? Uh, This is, (laughs) you could think of Zephaniah as evangelistic, He's speaking to a shameless nation, a wicked, unrepentant people, and this is how he delivers the gospel. You deserve the wrath that is coming. Repent. That was his message. If we believe what Zephaniah is saying about the tremendous horror and destruction coming on this day, then your heart should break for your neighbors Your heart should break for your children. Your heart should ache for your family members who do not believe Christ, who if Christ comes today to rescue the church, to hide the church from the coming day of the Lord, then all of those unbelievers in your life will be left to experience the wrath of the day of the Lord. So have compassion on them and call them to repentance so that they do not experience this universal destruction that is coming. This book should increase our zeal for evangelism, and it's going to affect the way we even preach the gospel. Because if you looked at the way that Old and New Testament, the preaching of the gospel came, this hurry up and repent message came, Oftentimes, it does not put before the sinner the afterlife of hell. Oftentimes, sometimes hell is in view. But many times, it is the earthly destruction that's coming when the wrath of God finally arrives in an untold, never-before-seen way to sinners who remain on earth. And you can just trace that out. Old and New Testament, that's the case. Do you have a category in your gospel proclamation for telling sinners that wrath is coming? Not just that they're going to God's wrath in hell, but that wrath is coming to them one day. 
And if they do not repent, they will be caught up in the rage of God. We've been reading about it for weeks now in Revelation. This should increase our zeal for evangelism. Fourthly, it should inspire awe at the majesty of God to just see what God is doing in this book. His wrath is fearsome. It is terrible. It is great. His justice is absolutely precise and accurate and justified. His justice is just is another way of saying that. And we should stand in awe of him. That's even specifically called for in chapter one, verse seven, to be silent. This posture of awe at the wrath of God, just to take your breath away at the scope of God's anger. Also his power to do what he's going to do worldwide is worth marveling at, as well as his faithfulness to his people to rescue them, those who are faithful to hide them, and his faithfulness to bring about the promises that seem that they'll never happen. He will fulfill his promises to Israel just as he articulated them to Abraham long ago, down to the very detail. We can marvel at the faithfulness of God and his love even for his people. Most notably in chapter three, God so exuberant over his repentant Christ-like people that he sings over them. God the Son sings praises over his people to God the Father just rejoicing in and delighting in the salvation of his people by the grace of God. That's just a marvelous scene. That'll change your, your worship, your perspective to think of God rejoicing over you, leaving you silent as he sings. We'll get there. Fifthly, strengthen your, this will strengthen Lord willing our ability to read God's word as we learn even the precision of Zephaniah to distinguish between the eternal state and the kingdom to come so that we read our Bible more effectively, so that we have a more precise understanding of particular prophecies and timing of the fulfillment of those prophecies. If you have trained your mind to meditate on the eternal state, on heaven, praise God. That is a spiritual discipline that we all need to master. And if you only think about heaven and you're missing the first thousand years of that, what will become the eternal state, then you're missing a significant portion of God's redemptive plan. And so we need to learn to read our Bibles well and possess the same precision as the prophet Zephaniah. What he anticipates as many Old Testament prophecies is not just heaven, the new heavens, the new earth, but it's a different time on this earth under these heavens. And so we need to read our Bible in the same way, making a distinction between those times. Also, to read our Bibles well and notice the difference between coming wrath and wrath and hell. There's a difference. We need to learn to make that distinction. Zephaniah doesn't emphasize the lake of fire or hell, but he emphasizes God's wrath coming here to sinners. And then sixthly, finally, Lord willing, this will grow our love for our Old Testament. This needs to grow our love for our Old Testament. This is the majority of our Bibles anyway. And so we need to be familiar with it. We need to love it. We need to learn how to see the particular articulation of the gospel in it. And we need to learn how to see Christ in our Old Testaments, particularly in the 12 in Zephaniah. And this book is going to help us to do that. So keep coming back for, for, for the subsequent weeks and, and be praying for me and be praying for your own heart and each other that God will use this book mightily. Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for your word to us. 
we could never uh, conjure up or imagine what you have uh, for this world, uh, not in your wrath to come and not in the coming joy and coming blessing. Teach us, God, to believe these things, train our hearts to love these truths and all its uh, multifaceted perspectives and details. And God, teach us to worship you because of these, these words. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.